Um, so it's a great pleasure to reduce Sam Mahadin. He's a consultant at Barts Hospital and is a, a great clinical expert on myocarditis and is going to share his, his thoughts with us. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Jerry and, and Perry. <laughs> you got it the right way around, though, so that's good. <laughs> So I, I hope by the end of my talk I, I'm able to convince you that you should include suspicions of myocarditis in almost every, if not every, um, acute cardiac assessment that you make. I also hope to be able to tell you what, uh, what to do when you have those suspicions. So how do you turn those suspicions into, into more concrete facts, diagnostic facts? That will be then followed by Dr. Sekri. Neha, Neha will talk about treatment of myocarditis. So I think I have a far easier task today. And I aim to do that by giving an overview of the immunopathology of myocarditis in very simple terms. Because I think it gives a good framework for understanding how and why different clinical presentations are different. And also to understand why different diagnostic tests can be useful at times and less so at other times. And these are the common, on the, on the right-hand side, these are the common presenting syndromes of myocarditis, like a heart attack, sudden cardiac death, with a very aggressive, progressive heart failure syndrome, with a more common um, run-of-the-mill dilated cardiomyopathy type presentation, as well as with less, less specific, quite unusual presentations that can include multisystem disorders like SLE, we heard about the dystronopathies. Uh, there are also patients that have unusual uh, syndromes and signs, but it's these I'm, I'm talking about today, these more common presenting um, syndromes. And we don't think about di uh, diagnosing myocarditis when we see these because there are, despite these being common presenting features of myocarditis, there are other much more common causes of these uh, syndromes. And we've heard a lot today about the way we think in concrete ways and our national guidelines, the way health services are organized, the way we're trained, the way we implement local pathways often, I think, constrain our thinking. And it isn't just the coronary artery doctors that think that everything, that everything is caused by um, coronary heart disease. I think we're quite guilty of similar things. If we see a presentation of sudden cardiac death or of DCM, we think inherited, but we shouldn't. So we've got to change the way we think if we're to diagnose myocarditis. And in addition, in addition to changing the way we think, we've also got to learn new languages. And those languages include the language of microbiology as well as the language of immunology. And I don't want this slide here to make any point except that there are many different causes of myocarditis that include infectious causes, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and so on as well as non-infectious causes, and these can be either toxic or they can result in uh, allergic re reactions. So we've got to learn the language of microbiology, and that's, uh, I think, for us, is, is, is one of the impediments to making diagnoses of myocarditis. We've also got to learn immunology. So Professor Rapetzi was asking about your, ch your chimeric cardiologist. I think a cardiologist needs to have the enthusiasm of an interventional cardiologist the physical stamina of an electrophysiologist, and the OCD uh, of Jerry or Perry. <laughs> so in, in talking about that, that, those new languages, this, this simple slide here is, 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 is meant to be a model of what happens in acute myocarditis that results in complete resolution or in healing. And starting with a noxious um, insult here that, has, that is cardiotropic, resulting in uh, cell damage or in cardiac damage that precipitates innate and adaptive immune responses which can be very varied but are usually but not always uh, um, coordinated by lymphocyte biology resulting in functional changes and in damage which may be acute and in the healing phase often myocarditis heal, appears to heal completely such that you won't find any evidence of it months, weeks or months later Often there may be some myocardial fibrosis, and I'll show an example of that. 
but so patients can present with, with, with cold evidence of myocardial damage. This presentation here may include individuals who, who present with arrhythmias, conduction block, sudden cardiac death, heart failure. And often in the acute phase, you also see evidence of more systemic effects of inflammation, so you should be looking for that, looking for evidence of elevated CRP, et cetera, et cetera, and a background that may tell you a, a, a bit about cause, so exposure, uh, features of, of, of um, systemic effects of viral infection, et cetera, et cetera. In red on this slide, everything in red is potentially tractable or detectable by tests, and that's why I've put them there, because our tests can tell us a lot about what's going on in the acute phase of myocarditis. In contrast, a minority of individuals progress to a more chronic inflammatory state. And that's either because of continued exposure to the noxious agent, chronic infection, for example, or because there's a, a problem with the immune regulation and a triggered autoimmunity then develops that's independent of the initial trigger, resulting in chronic inflammation. And in that situation, you may be left with very little that's detectable by your tests Chronic inflammation may be relapsing, remitting, and it's more like a smoldering rather than a hot fire. And our tests find it very difficult to detect this, and this is the nub of the problem in myocarditis. What we saw in acute disease is easy to detect. What we see in chronic disease is very difficult to detect, and this is where we can probably make a, diff a big difference in treatment. So missed opportunities. Okay, so I, I, I think I've, 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 I've argued that um, there are different presentations, both acute and chronic, and they may reflect different stages of the disease. There's also different kinds of myocarditis based on the, the cause, but also the type of inflammatory response. And to try and detect those, we've got a number of blood tests or routine diagnostic tests. These are routine tests in cardiology. They don't have very much specificity for cause, but if you put them into the right context and you use them in an iterative and integrated way, they do provide very useful information. But our, our, uh, the, the tests that we use, um, that we rely on heavily, are those that provide us with a degree of characterization of the muscle. And those are either invasive uh, tests, endomyocardial biopsy, which provide you evidence of inflammation, but also tell you much, much more. They tell you the cell type, lymphocytes, eosinophils, giant cells, as well as potentially telling you the cause. You can detect nucleic acid that tells you you've got a viral infection, for example. Invasive test and CMR has, I think, revolutionized the way we now start to diagnose myocarditis because it's non-invasive. You can do it again and again and again so you can follow course of, of inflammation. But it also provides you with a good uh, assessment of myocardial function. It also tells you where the inflammation is. It's not a global process usually. It's focal. As I said, you can repeat it. Uh, Leon will talk a lot more this afternoon about, uh, about nuclear imaging, and I'll only touch on that very briefly. So for those of you, uh, so I'm now going to talk about those specific tests, biopsy and, and, and MRI. And, and for those of you that are familiar with uh, MRI, you can close your eyes and have a little nap. Uh, for everyone else, MRI is useful because its unique selling point is that it provides a degree of tissue characterization, surrogates, surrogate evidence of abnormal tissue. And here's normal heart, a heart that's had a recent myocardial infarction, and a, a case of acute myocarditis. And you can see in T2-weighted imaging, we're imaging for water. There's lots of edema around here at the apex of this heart, very close to a VSD. This is an acute uh, ischemic VSD following an infarct. Uh, on early gadolinium enhancement, you can see that there's uh, what we call uh, microvascular obstruction. There's, there's a, a, a loss of integrity of the microcirculation, and the late enhancement imaging tells us there's been a lot of injury there, so this is interstitial expansion. In the myocarditis example, um, yes, I convince you that there's increased uh, swelling there of the lateral wall, infralateral wall of the left ventricle. On edema imaging, there's a lot of water in that, in that uh, left ventricular wall, consistent with inflammation, edema, myocarditis. And the, the, there's this pattern of late enhancement here, which is very typical for myocarditis, in that it's epicardial, it's not confined to a coronary territory, and it often skips, it's, it's discontinuous. Uh, and difficult to see here, but on, on, on this imaging, there's evidence of hyperemia and increased capillary leak. So this is how we use MRI to provide us with evidence of myocarditis. It doesn't tell us 
what the cause is. So that's a massive limitation uh, to, to a myocardial, to, to MRI, and a biopsy, on the other hand, can. And this is an example taken from a, a book by Leslie Cooper, which shows how invasive uh, an endomyocardial biopsy is. You take a big bite out of, uh, in this case, the right ventricle. But you get what we still see as the gold standard information, diagnostic information, evidence of muscle death as well as inflammation. And, and this is an example here of acute lymphocytic myocarditis. This is one of our own giant cell myocarditics and one of our own sarcoid myocarditics. Uh, and here is that more difficult group of patients who have the smoldering borderline uh, um, um, inflammation, uh, histologically termed borderline lymphocytic myocarditis in this case. But that, despite all those, those benefits of, of biopsy, biopsy is, is severely limited, at least in its conventional use, because number one, it's invasive, and it, it carries risks of complications. Uh, number two is, is the sensitivity of, of, of um, biopsy, even in optimal circumstances, can be very, very low. And this is a famous uh, experiment from Stanford, where 36 hearts from people who died of confirmed myocarditis was subjected to a biopsy protocol. And if only one biopsy was taken, only 18% of cases were identified. And as many as, what does that say again, 17 samples were required before you get a sensitivity or diagnostic accuracy anywhere near acceptable for, for diagnostic use. So it's not a, a very sensitive test. And you can see why here. This is another case of myocarditis. The lesions are often on the left side of the heart, not, not the right, and traditionally we've biopsied the right side of the heart. They're also epicardial, so they're not immediately accessible to the endocardial biopsy, and they skip, they, they jump around. You know, there's uh, basal septum here has, n has no lesion, and there's lesions. So they're discontinuous, um, patchy lesions. I'm sure we'll hear uh, later on this afternoon when we, we hear um, Mike Ashworth talk about biopsy, how we can improve the performance of biopsy. And that's done in, in two ways, by new techniques, uh, staining, looking for lymphocyte subsets, for example, looking for nucleic acid that can detect um, uh, new, um, viruses, but also using uh, spatial guidance from MRI to tell you where to go, where you're more likely to get a positive result. And it, this is why it's so important to get um, a biopsy information. And, and on the left-hand side, um, it's a comparison of, of survival curves of individuals with um, the bogeyman of myocarditis, which is giant cell myocarditis. It's a terrible diagnosis to have. And this is the more common lymphocytic dilated cardiomyopathy presentation of myocarditis. Very different. So identifying which patients have this is, is tremendously important. Here are Kaplan Meyer curves that are, uh, this is a, um, a little bit um, retrospective because this is looking for evidence of enterovirus. So there are differences in survival, we think, based on the ability to demonstrate the presence or absence of particular uh, viral particles. And this, as Neho, I think, might tell us, is, is, is a, a key uh, component of how future stratified medicine for myocarditis will develop. Um, I've included this, this slide um, because I think it's helpful uh, to consider how one uses endomyocardial biopsies. And this is a very pragmatic approach to using biopsy in the, uh, in the um, diagnosis of, of myocarditis because most people with myocarditis have very benign disease. And so you want to use biopsy when there's a chance that you can detect uh, a high-risk type of myocarditis. And these high-risk types of myocarditis, giant cell sarcoid and eosinophilic myocarditis, have specific treatments that probably are effective. And so the, 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 the pragmatic part of the guidance is, is that the clinical features, the presenting features, as well as some high-risk clinical uh, aspects, the red flags, if you like, uh, help guide um, biopsy. And in this case, they're recommending, uh, in, in the first scenario here, recommending biopsy um, if, if there's evidence of rapidly progressive left ventricular uh, uh, impairment, or here evidence of really quite an aggressive tissue destruction uh, on the basis of ventricular arrhythmias and of conduction disease.
Okay, so I've talked a little bit about the, the, the theory of, of, of myocarditis and the tests that we use. I'm now briefly going to talk about some of these clinical presentations, trying to argue with you that they're actually not as uncommon, uh, uncommon as, as, as you might think. And, and the commonest form of, of acutely of myocarditis is the heart failure-like presentation. I think we've all seen, seen these. And they probably are re responsible for as many as 10% of acute coronary syndrome pathway activations, meaning there are about 7,000 or so in the UK every year. It's a benign condition in most people, and there's no, very little information on long-term follow-up, but we know that the long-term follow-up is, 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 is very benign after a, a very early um, uh, uh, risk. And in our own series, we see about an 8% acute event rate, most of which was either giant cell or, or sarcoidosis. Uh, there's limited uh, uh, um, long-term data, but they're very easy to diagnose because of the, the severity of the florid nature of the acute inflammatory, uh, acute inflammatory process. And full myocarditis is, is probably quite similar to, to acute myocarditis, but just with more tissue destruction. And again, if you survive the initial um, presentation with supportive therapy, you do, you do very well. It's not a chronic problem. I'll show some examples, an example now of, of one such case, and this is a young man who presented with ST elevation, chest pain, elevated troponin, normal coronaries, and the echocardiogram that was done after his angiogram made a diagnosis of HCM because he had thick walls. But actually looking at the MRI, you, you can understand that, that that thickening is probably due to lots and lots and lots of water and lots of interstitial expansion. We didn't biopsy him because he got better very quickly, and a month later his... War swelling is gone, the late enhancement has got better. 30 months later, that heart looked completely normal. So this is, a, this is the more typical type of acute myocarditic um, presentation. Most don't need any therapy. This is overwhelmingly what happens. It's not the only thing that happens, though. And this is a similar, uh, this is a case where the presentation is very similar. Again, a diagnosis of HCM was entertained in this person that presented with chest pain, non-sustained VT. Here you can see the late enhancement and the T2-weighted imaging is very focal, very punched out, and extends onto the anterior RV wall. We suspected sarcoid. He wanted to go home. He went home with a halter, waiting for a biopsy. This is what happened while he was wearing his halter, resulting in a shock. It's diagnosed with sarcoidosis, biopsy, and he now has an ICD. I think Nay will talk about sarcoid more in her uh, hair session. Um, sudden cardiac death, now, again here, sudden cardiac death is something that um, it, myocarditis contributes to, uh, and in some series it's, it's, it's as low as 5% of cases. In, in series that include predominantly young men, it's as high as 10 to 20%. I think the 20% uh, figure comes from uh, American military where just following, um, just following a program of, of inoculation for smallpox, um, but it, it does contribute to a significant number of, of sudden cardiac deaths. And, of course, this is important not just for, not just for the families. It, we, 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 um, in, in families that have sudden cardiac death, there's, there's often a very difficult and prolonged um, uh, attention to the possibility that this could be inherited. So making the correct diagnosis is important for, for families, but also for individuals, because you want to be able to treat them on the basis of, of what they have. And there is very little information, uh, published information, as to what happens in the longer term to individuals who have had sudden cardiac death and have been resuscitated uh, as a result of myocarditis. We've started to collect some data ourselves, uh, and, and this, in, this data will be presented this year at the ESC. And what we think we see, uh, based on MRI diagnosis, is that as many as 13% of sudden cardiac arrest survivors who have normal coronaries have good evidence for myocarditis. The commonest diagnostic group were DCM, of course, and some of these may, may also have had myocarditis. Uh, still 35% left hospital following cardiac arrest without a, a, a confirmed diagnosis. But myocarditis is, is, is definitely a common contributor to that group of people, and our preliminary evidence suggests that they have a very poor prognosis free of events such that in, in, this, in this panel here are the um, 22 patients with myocarditis, and this is their Kaplan-Meier uh, rate free of uh, ICD shocks or death, very high rate of, of events. 
and here we've just removed the seven sarcoids. So it's not just those sarcoid patients that are doing badly. This clearly deserves further attention. Uh, finally, the last clinical presentation we'll talk about is of dilated cardiomyopathy. We've heard from Jerry that uh, myocarditis does contribute to this. If you're writing uh, a research grant trying to get money to look at inherited causes of DCM, you'll say it causes only 10% of cases. If you're looking for money to talk about myocarditis, you'll say uh, it causes as many as two-thirds of cases. And that reflects how difficult it is to confirm this diagnosis. And that difficulty is based on the poor sensitivity of biopsy, as well as the difficulty in using information like this to make a diagnosis. And what I mean by that is this. These, again, are quite old slides. But here, um, on the left-hand side, are incidences of the detection of enterovirus in people with DCM. So the range is, ranges from 0% to a very high percent. But more importantly, you can detect evidence of virus in otherwise normal hearts. So demonstrating a virus in someone's heart does not make a diagnosis of myocarditis certain. You then ask about MRI, and I said to you before how good MR was at making diagnoses or contributing to diagnosis in the acute phase. In chronic uh, progressive myocarditis, where the inflammation is, is that borderline uh, type, MRI performs particularly poorly. It only detects about 44% of cases uh, using late enhancement and possibly as many as none uh, using T2-weighted imaging. There are other MRI sequences that are being evaluated and validated, but still MRI is not the answer to the problem here. And the problem is how to detect inflammation that's borderline in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, this is a slide I've, I've borrowed from Eleanor Wicks and Leon, um, and this slide is, talking, is, is arguing um, for the uh, use of PET imaging. And PET imaging, in, in this instance, is using FDG. We're looking to see whether there's an increased use of glucose by the heart. Um, in, 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 uh, the, and the assumption is that, that increased use of glucose is a consequence of uh, um, inflammatory cell activity. And here, the cine doesn't work, but this is a DCM sort of um, uh, picture. There is very little information there on T2-weighted imaging suggesting inflammation. It's homogenous. There's no inflammatory signal there. And on early gadolinium enhancement, you've got this backwall epicardial late enhancement that's so typical of non-ischemic cardiac disease. You see it in desmenopathies. You see it in uh, inherited cardiac disease, you see it in myocarditis. But when you superimpose the PET image, you can see beautifully that something else is happening in that, in that area there. And the question is whether or not this is inflammation. Uh, and I'm sure Leon will, will uh, shed some light on that. And, and, the, and the question is, can this be he helpful in, in detecting myocarditis in the clinical scenario that I think is most useful, and that is in DCM. So, last few slides are about our approach, uh, diagnostic. We suspect acute myocarditis in the scenarios we've, we've mentioned. Uh, our first test is an MRI scan, and since about 2008, any patient that's had troponin-positive event with normal coronaries has had an MRI scan. And we then decide on whether to biopsy or not based on the presence or absence of risk features, either acutely or following review. And those, those um, risk features are, are, are I think we've, we've discussed already, uh, but are listed up here on, on the slide. I won't go into more detail. Our approach to suspected chronic myocarditis is, is more difficult. And I'll start by saying that we often approach the, these discussions in an MDT. The ideal chimeric uh, cardiologist is the MDT. And, and that MDT involves imaging, cardiomyopathy, as well as immunology and infectious diseases experts. And I think this is what we do. We, we, we do an MRI scan. We interpret that in the context of the clinical history. We often will obtain a PET scan. And if the PET scan is hot, we'll, we'll, take it, we'll get a biopsy. And that leads to at least two categories of, of patients. One where we see no inflammation, but there's LV impairment, so they get standard heart failure treatment. The second is that there is inflammation, but we can't detect a virus. They get standard heart failure treatment. 
and then this group, where is virus? They also get standard heart failure treatment. And the stratifi stratified medicine question is, what is the question? What, what else do you add to that? What, you know, what do we do? And again, that will speak to what Neha will talk about. So finally, um, myocarditis is a, an uncommon cause of, common, of the commonest uh, cardiac presentations, and you do need to have an index of suspicion. There are some red flags, but what you need to do is really think outside the pathways in a way that's integrative uh, and also iterative. You go and re-examine uh, evidence when uh, other things change. There's a short early window for the most accurate diagnostic testing, and in many cases, angiography, troponin, and CMR is enough. You don't need to biopsy everybody. Um, we and others uh, will use endomyocardial biopsy if malignant causes of myocarditis are likely, and there we are looking currently for sarcoid, giant cell, or use nephilic myocarditis. The future may hold other things, and the future includes uh, diagnosing, stratifying, and treating chronic inflammatory heart disease. Um, currently, the treatment is nonspecific, but we'll think here how um, there are good reasons to suspect the treatment for that will change in the near future. And that's me. Thank you very much.